Welcome everybody on Zoom. Welcome everybody in the lecture hall to this new week, the uh, one of the last ones actually. Um, this is the last part one set of slides with actual material. Um, and after that, we will uh, wrap up. So let's see how far we go today. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on? Until now, what we've looked at is tables, right? Rows and columns. So we saw that we can call the rows tuppers or records, or we can see them as maps or partial functions. And then a table is a collection of uh, rows or a collection of records or a collection of maps. Uh, and then we've studied the uh, relational model, the mathematical definition. We've looked into the mathematical algebra, which is the mathematical abstraction of what you can do with tables. Uh, then we've looked at an implementation of a query language called SQL, SQL, with which we can actually uh, implement everything you can do with the relational algebra. And then you can sit in front of your laptop and type your queries with SQL and then see the, the results appearing magically uh, on your um, on your uh, laptop. And this is thanks to the power of data independence, because when you use SQL, you don't actually care how the query was actually executed and how the results were computed, because what you want is the results. And in fact, you're giving the engine the freedom to choose all by itself how it's going to uh, be executing things. Um, in fact, a lot of these ideas, the facts that we have a model, we have a syntax, CSV, for example, we have uh, an algebra, we have a query language, we have implementations, uh, various implementations that, uh, that implement the language. This doesn't only apply to tables. It actually applies to many other shapes that we have. There are uh, trees, there are graphs, there are cubes, and so on. And today, we will look into another shape, uh, cubes, uh, which are also very useful and uh, it dates back to the 90s. So the main reason why they are cubes, uh, the main use case uh, that it emerged from is the ability at the sea level of uh, companies uh, to, um, to produce reports, right? These fancy uh, quarterly or yearly reports that consolidate everything, showing the sales, showing the revenues, uh, the, uh, the balance sheet and so on of the, uh, of the company. Um, and so, of course, you need to produce these reports, right? So you can, of course, do this by hand using Excel and so on. But as you can imagine, um, there are plenty of problems with that. So this is why in the 90s, uh, some new technologies were invented in order to do this, which is called business intelligence, right? How do you uh, aggregate data at the scale of the entire company in order to, uh, to analyze it uh, 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 and, uh, and make informed decisions about your business, right? So you see, you know, the prehistory is 1970s, right? This is where relational databases in a modern form started because we saw they are thousands of years old. That's the age of transactions, right? It's a database where you have inserts, updates, deletes the whole time uh, and uh, possibly with transactions as we saw, uh, and then you can query it, right? So that's uh, the front end of a website, for example. But in the 1990s, that was the golden age of business intelligence. There are a couple of startups initially. I don't know if they were already called startups back then, but uh, um, probably. Um, they, they came up with, uh, with this cube database implementations to do business intelligence. And as you can imagine, they got bought, purchased by the big uh, ones, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, who now each have their own offering in cubes. Then in the 2000s, it's the age of big data, but this is then big data for engineers. So this is not something we look at right now. So what I will start with, uh, in this lecture, before we go to the actual model of cubes and what you can do with uh, cubes, uh, we'll start with a contrasting of these two things, uh, of, uh, of uh, what was before the 90s and then in the 90s with cubes. Um, note that in the uh, collective imagination, it is very common to associate what we call OLTP. I will tell you in a moment what that means, but to associate OLTP with relational databases, with tables, and OLAP with data cubes. But as you will see, there is no real reason why it has to be tables on the left and cubes on the right. Um, but I'll come back to that. First, let me tell you what this means. OLTP, does anybody know actually what OLTP means? Okay, that means online transaction uh, online transaction processing, right? And OLAP means online analytical processing. These are two ways to look at data. And now I'm going to explain why these two ways are uh, different. First, the first difference that they have is that in OLTP, 
it's transactions transaction oriented so the typical usage of your database system is that there are plenty of people who constantly insert records delete records update records and so on and so on the whole time maybe through a website maybe through internal software in your company but the whole point of the database is to keep records record not in the database sense but in the in the real historical sense right you keep records of what your company is doing right so this is really record keeping real time right you have this constant flow of information into the database uh, that uh, that comes uh, in and out right olap is not for record keeping it's for decision support you want to aggregate the data uh, into cubes typically in order to make decisions um, so as a consequence, these are other differences, but you will see this, this will all make sense. When you are looking at uh, record keeping and constantly updating, inserting, and so on, what you can focus on is uh, small records, right? You have maybe a huge table with a million uh, products or a million people, but you almost always focus on one person at a time or one product at a time. Why? Because somebody might be visiting your web shop and is looking at a product page, right? So you're looking at a specific product. You also have maybe a specific customer placing an order right now, right? So you're interested in really detailed individual records, right? In OLAP, uh, yes? Oh, let me accept you again. Yeah. Are you back to the room as well now? Oh, okay. All right. Um, Seems like uh, a, a computer crash. So this is why uh, this is why uh, many of you could only be accepted now in the room. Uh, but welcome to uh, all of you. I was just starting explaining the difference between LTP and OLAP, and you can still catch up with the, the recording because everything was recorded. All right. So let me continue. So. In OLTP, you're, you're looking at individual records, right? Uh, typically, in the typical usage. In OLAP, what you want to do is summarize and consolidate data, right? You have your, imagine your large corporation with uh, uh, thousands of employees, and you want these high level fancy charts that you can give to the CFO uh, uh, in order to have the overview on what's going on, right? Um, this is also always related, right? In OLTP, you have lots of rights. Customers placing orders, new customers registering, the inventory being kept up to date, and so on. So you have a lot of rights. In OLAP, you have lots of read. You're interested in reading the information. You put it there, and then you analyze it. Right? So lots of reads. On OLTP, you typically work on small sets of records. It means that most of the queries you do against your database will only touch a small part of the database. Yes, we have a question over there. Maybe uh, you could bring the microphone. Am I understanding this right? That um, OLAP is more a bit of interested in the metadata of the OLTP. So uh, metadata, which products are bought the most overall and in which frequency which are less bought and at which time and so on i think your intuition is correct it's just that i wouldn't use the word metadata to describe that metadata what you typically call metadata it would be the name of the columns the type of the columns and so on like a schema uh, but what you describe is is pretty much correct that olap is basically some sort of consolidated view of oltp Right, and typically, I will also explain that you actually take things from OLTP from your data from your regular database, and every year you're going to just pour it into OLAP, right? But basically, what you're looking at at OLAP is an aggregation of the data of OLTP, so it's going to be smaller, it's going to be less data and less fine grains than in OLTP, right? So I think your intuition is correct, just not metadata, but more like consolidated and summarized view of OLTP. Did it address your question? Awesome. OK. So in OLTP, almost all queries touch a small part of the database. This is why indices are actually so useful, because in indices, you can solve this very, very well when you're looking at small parts of the database. But in OLAP, you do analysis of our big chunks. In fact, very often, you touch the entire database or the entire queue. OK. The other difference is that when you are in an OLTP system, it's uh, fully interactive. 
And thankfully so, because if you shop on the internet, you don't want to have to wait for a day every time you look for a product or you place an order, right? You really want the page to display instantly. And when you put things in the cart, it has to be instant, right? With the database in the background. But in OLAP, it's more like slow interactive. So it can be uh, different orders of magnitudes, but typically not under a second, maybe 10 seconds, one minute, might even need maybe one hour to compute something. So it's absolutely not real time. Uh, in any way. Another aspect, so you see I'm throwing plenty of differences at you, is that in OLTP, we focused on consistency. This is why we have this, uh, this uh, normal form, right? With the normal forms, we avoid anomalies, we avoid repeating data, and by not repeating data, we make things consistent. Because if your data is in normal form, you just need to update it at one place. If it's not in normal form, we saw that the problems arise because you need to remember to update it at several places if your data is stored at several places. So in OLTP, the focus is on consistency, right? The normal forms and everything we've saw we've seen until now. In OLAP, you don't you don't care why? Because you read the data, you don't write the data. So this is why you don't care about uh, updates anomalies because you don't update the data at all. So in OLAP, it's totally fine to be redundant and store the multi the, the same things multiple times just because it's going to accelerate things uh, to to allow yourself uh, to do that. So we have a lot of redundancy and we have a lot of data that is pre-computed. Uh, just in case it's needed, even though in OLTP, we wouldn't pre-compute it in that way, right? Okay. And again, so I'm continuing to contrast, so hopefully that it's becoming clear. So in OLTP, we have a lot of transactions on small portions of data. It's your million customers visiting your website and placing orders. In OLAP, it's the opposite. We are looking at very large portions of the data, many, many, many joins all over the place, right? To 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 uh, to possibly pre-compute it, of course, but it's uh, join heavy, uh, and it's a few long, heavy queries with the goal to build these fancy charts for the CFO. Okay, and I added even more contrasts there between the two uh, on uh, on uh, various aspects, right? Um, I, I will leave you uh, look at that on offline. If you have any questions, uh, well, of course we can we can get back to you. But so the, the goal is to give you an intuition uh, between the between the uh, uh, the differences, right? Um, okay. So I hope that now you see that at OLTP we are looking at plenty of transactions on small portions of the data, data in high normal form in tables and so on. And OLAP, we are just reading the data, we are consolidating, summarizing things, and producing uh, uh, some, some fancy charts. For whom is this intuition clear? Okay, now I'm coming back to the shapes. It's very often that people, when hearing OLTP, will think of relational tables and relational databases. And it's very common that when people hear about OLAP, they will think of data cubes that I will show you now. Uh, but be careful because even though people often do that, it doesn't have to be tied to tables and cubes. In fact, if you take big data for engineers later, we will see that what we are doing with uh, MapReduce and Spark and data lakes and so on, you could call it OLAP, right? Even though it's not data cubes. Uh, and the same goes for OLTP. You can actually do uh, transactions on very small chunks of data also with other shapes and tables, right? But just for the purpose of this lecture, you, it's, it's fine if you think if you think of it as uh, tables versus cubes, with the idea that it's write intensive for OLTP and read intensive for OLAP. Okay. So now, if we think about OLAP, what we do typically is sales analytics, web analytics. Also, you can analyze your websites like that. You can support the management of a company. You can support the census, for example, in the US. That's one of the first use cases for computers, in fact, at the end of the 19th century. Um, scientific databases, and so on and so on. Right. So typically, when you, uh, <laughs> when you do OLAP and deal with data cubes, the fancy term that people came up with is data warehousing. It's like you put your data in a big warehouse. And there are four uh, characteristics of a data warehouse that you use. So it's a subject-oriented, integrated, time-variant, non-volatile collection of data. But I'm going to go through the four, right? Uh, all with the goal of making decisions. Subject-oriented means that typically when you have a data warehouse, you have a very specific goal in mind. You're looking at your customers, your sales, your products, your events, and so on and so on, right? So this is why it's subject 
oriented, much more than in a typical relational database. Second, it's integrated in the sense that typically what happens is that your company might have hundreds of different databases that are OLTP, that are working every day for making the company work. Um, and what you do is that on regular intervals, maybe every night or every quarter or every year, you just pour over the data that comes from this operational part of the company, of the, of the databases, and you pour them into cubes into your data warehouse. And once you have poured it into the cube, then you can start analyzing it, right? So this is what it means to be integrated. You have the, all of the database of the companies, and then you fetch this data periodically and put it into your data warehouse for your business analytics. Time variance means that when you do sales and uh, financial reports and so on, people think these are accountants very often. So they think in years and in quarters and in months and so on and so on, right? So the years are actually super important. The, uh, the time elapsing is super important. And in any financial report, you will always see like this year, last year, and maybe the previous years, the previous quarters and so on. In typical cases, you will be interested in the past five to 10 years, right? What goes beyond 10 years, usually is, uh, is uh, forgotten or thrown away. Um, the reason is there are, several, there are several reasons. One reason can be the cost, right? Because if you, if you want to go further than 10 years, that also has costs in terms of maintenance. Another reason is that things change, the systems change, and maybe what's older than 10 years was so different than uh, what there is today that, again, it would be too costly to support how different it was back then. The schemas of your tables might have evolved and so on. In fact, we had, uh, uh, back then, there was a, a continuing education student who shared a few insights about how they do data warehousing in their own company. And uh, there, he was saying that they even had data from a century ago about like actual footprints of papers on the pipes in the building and so on. Uh, um, it, was, it was very interesting. But basically, um, we are interested in the, in the past five to 10 years uh, of data in the data warehouse. Uh, you might also have data protection issues with that, right? That, uh, that also uh, uh, don't allow you to keep some data. And finally, non-volatile means, but here again, I'm repeating myself, it's not about updating the data. You basically pour it periodically, maybe every quarter or every night into the, into the data warehouse, and then it's frozen. You don't touch it. That's it. It's like, the, like it is. You just start analyzing it. Uh, with your queries, but there are no updates. You load it, you put it in the system, and you access it, and that's pretty much it. Uh, as a consequence, what you have in an OLAP data cube, in a data warehouse, is derived data. That's data that was originally in your relational database and that you copied over, right? So it is derived. That's also very, uh, very important, right? It's not the original data. So typically, in many companies, they have this architecture in the sense that they have their hundreds of databases on the, on the left, right? The uh, uh, customer relationship management, the inventory, uh, and so on and so on, SAP, so everything you can uh, possibly imagine. And then they ETL it uh, into the, uh, the uh, data warehouse, and then they can uh, slice and dice their cubes, they can produce the reports, they can even use machine learning, mine the data, and so on. Does anybody what ETL means? Does anybody know? Because I use the verb ETL, right? It's actually three letters. So ETL means extract, transform, load. Uh, that's typically what you do when you have data somewhere and you need to move it somewhere else in a different database that's called ETLing, right? I, I'm, I'll come back to that. You can think of loading if you want uh, for now. Um, and because of the, what I told you about the redundancy, typically you had maybe hundreds of tables in the original database, but you basically materialize them and join them into a non-normal view, typically. This is not necessarily going to be in normal form. It can, but it doesn't have to, right? And you materialize the views. Now, you know what a materialized view is, right? We, we've seen it uh, two weeks ago. So you, you can think of OLAP as a, material, a materialized view uh, of the original database, but not a materialized view of everything. It's a materialized view on the high level aggregates, right? So imagine that you have, I'm oversimplifying, but imagine that you have your OLTP database with terabytes of data, and you're creating a view with a select from where group by query that just returns maybe uh, uh, one gigabyte of data, one thousandth of the data, but highly aggregated, and you create a view 
that is kind of your data warehouse. Right? Of course, in reality, it's more complex. It's not just creating a view. You have a lot of work involved to, to pour it over to the data warehouse. But this is how you can think of it. Okay. And the reason we do that, because we could actually, you could think, okay, why don't we directly query the original databases, right? It would be much simpler. The problem is that it's just too heterogeneous. Uh, in real life, companies might have 10 different kinds of databases. They have teams that maybe are not even speaking with each other. Uh, I don't know if anybody has you, of you has worked in a company, but this is the real life, right? And so it's just impossible to just connect to all the databases and try to, uh, to, to join the data and, um, and uh, 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 have this summarized view. So this is why you really need a data warehouse to do that, right? And when you query OLAP, there are people who actually connect to the data warehouse from Excel or a spreadsheet software and so on, and they are able to create the fancy charts in Excel connected to the warehouse. And typically they click and it's one to 10 seconds whenever you generate a view. So it's not exactly real time, as I said. And then you might also have systems that are continuously monitoring tracking, for example, for fraud detection, you know, that sort of things. Uh, and then that can actually take hours or even run the whole time. Okay. In terms of products, is as I told you that in the 90s, there were these small companies called S-Base, Cognos, uh, uh, SAP. Uh, back then, now they're bigger and they're on their own. But uh, basically, you have all of these uh, companies and they got bought uh, by Oracle, bought S-Base, IBM, bought Cognos, and so on and so on. At Microsoft, they started analysis services to do the data warehousing and the cubes, right? So you see, the first three should not surprise you. These are the big three of databases, at least of the, of the let's say, the good old databases, right? Oracle, IBM, uh, SQL Server. And then you have SAP that is also uh, one of the uh, dominant players there that uh, companies use. Okay. And now a few words on ETLing that I told you I'd come back to. So ETL means extract, transform, loads. This is when you take the data from all of these databases all over the place in your company and pour that into your data cube. Extract, transform, loads. Um, we call that ETL. And actually, as I said, it's a verb. People really use it as a verb. Like I'm ETLing the data uh, from the databases into the, the data warehouse. Okay, so when you extract, there are so many, it's, it's very complex. Typically, you have uh, Accenture, McKinsey, uh, you know, all the companies on board in order to help you do these things, but uh, you have to decide when you trigger the extraction of data, uh, the gateways that you need between your databases, like how do you orchestrate things in such a way that it's smooth, you know, that it's, uh, that it's working in the long term. You might want incremental updates, meaning that if you do it, for example, every night, you don't want to pour all the data every night. You only want to, you only want to pour the data that changed. So this is what we call incremental updates. And then there is the log extraction also if you're trying to uh, extract information from your logs, like your website analytics, for example. Um, then transforms, that's the, that was the E, that's the T now. Uh, when you transform the data, it means that you don't pour it as it is. You typically need to restructure it a little, right? So you need to aggregate a bit. You might need to fix things. Like, for example, you might have a lot of inconsistencies across languages. You need to clean the data. That's a billion dollar business, cleaning the data. It's, it's super, super hard. Even in machine learning, everybody will agree that this is the one thing that is very, very hard. Uh, to do. But you need to clean your data when you pour it into the data warehouse. When you have your cube, it has to be clean. And you will understand why uh, when I show you the cubes. Finally, you might want to filter the data. You don't want everything, maybe everything in the past 10 years. You might want to split some things, merge some things, join some things, and so on. Right? And finally, when you load the data, there are also a few problems that might arise. For example, you want integrity constraints. Uh, I'm, I'm just throwing uh, vague ideas, but for example, you, you might have types uh, for the dimensions of your cube, right? A, a year must be an integer and so on. Some numbers must be positive. You might also want, if you're thinking as an accountant, that when you have a balance sheet, uh, then the uh, uh, equities and uh, uh, liabilities must match uh, your assets and so on and so on. Um, you might want to build indices for the cube to be faster. Uh, they also have indices. You might, want, you might want to sort and organize your data. You might also want to partition your data in specific ways. Right? Um, and finally, when you do this ETLing, you need to decide when. Is it every night? Is it every 
uh, quarter every month? Is it every year, right? You need to design that. The granularity as well. Is it the entire database? Is it only small parts of the database? And you need to come up with the infrastructure. For sure, what you're not going to do is update or ETL the data during the day, because then you're going to have all of the other people in the company being mad at you because that's going to slow down everything, right? So this is why I'm saying typically at night, right? When nobody else is, uh, is actually using the, the, uh, the other databases of the company. Okay, that was the, just the general part, the motivation part, right? So this is why it was very generic and so on. I just wanted to give you an intuition, right? For whom is that here, this all app data warehousing, the, the overall idea? Okay, so now we are going to the exciting things. These are the things that I actually prefer because now we are going to look at details and examples and actually see it uh, in action. So I'm going to start by giving you the data model uh, of cubes, just in the same way that we've done it for tables. Yep. Oh, there was again, okay. These things happen. Oh, it's just, yeah, there's two of you. All right, you're back. Okay. Who is like me and actually prefers to see examples, details, you know, working directly on concrete things? Some of you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here you go. Uh, in a data cube, the data is stored in multi dimensional hypercubes. And a question on yeah. Zoom What would be the metrics to decide on when to update a data cube? Again, time versus volume? Um, to make the decision, I assume. So I think there are various considerations. There's the consideration of the time it takes, meaning it, if, it, if it takes several hours uh, or more than several hours, then maybe you cannot do it every night. So the time it takes has an impact on the frequency uh, that's directly related to the volume of data that it takes. It's also related to how can you afford slowing down your systems, but probably also from the other side, um, how often do you need the data to be, uh, to be imported, like the freshness of the data. For example, uh, if you want to do quarterly financial reports, then you only need quarter data, right? So every quarter, the companies pull their, the data and the constructs their financial reports, right? Um, there is a reason why it's not more than quarterly, right? Because we could say, okay, why don't we ask, for example, the stock exchanges, they could ask the data to be monthly, right? Monthly reports or weekly reports. But that would be almost impossible to do because even quarterly is, a, is, is very hard to do. For many companies, it's a, it's a challenge to, to, put, to pull all the data. Right. I'm not sure if I answered the question satisfactorily. Yeah, all right. Okay, so what is a data cube? It's like a hypercube. So I put this Rubik's cube right there to, to give you an idea, but why hyper? Because it can be more than three dimensions, right? So, but you can visualize it in three dimensions because this is what we are used to. So typically, as a simple example in three dimension, we could have a dimension that is the year, right? 2022, uh, 20, 2021, 2020, 2019, right? Then a second dimension that is a country, uh, for example, uh, Switzerland, Austria, Germany. And then we could have as the uh, additional dimension, I'm going to remove this from the string. There you go. You have a product, for example, is it a phone? Uh, is it a television? Uh, is it, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what you're selling. And then what happens is that once you have decided what your dimensions are, you'll see all these little cubes that make up the big cube. Every one of these little cubes corresponds to the intersection of these dimensions and is one value. For example, that little cube could be 2016 Switzerland server, right? 2016 because it's on the second uh, uh, um, layer, right, from the top. CH because it's in the front, right, the front layer, and server because it's the fifth uh, column starting from the left, right. So typically you have all of these little values, but they are nicely organized in a queue. You could call this 2016 CH server the dimensional coordinates of the little queue, right. It's like a coordinate system, uh, and when you have a year, a country, and a product, and that gives you the exact coordinates of a small value, and something in there, there is a number, maybe 10, you know, 1,987, whatever number, right, for this particular cell. So now, 
what can the dimensions be, right? I give you in that case a, a year, a country, and a product. In general, the typical dimensions you're going to have is uh, where. That's a geographical information. Is it Switzerland? Is it Zurich? Is it a canton? And so on. Who might be about, for example, the sales team? Who did what? Uh, so all the, all the people. It can be currency, especially for a financial report. When you report uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your balance sheet or your income statement or the cash flow statement, you need to say, is it US dollars? Is it Swiss francs? Is it euros? Is it Indian rupees? And so on. What, for example, in the case of, uh, of uh, financial statements that could be uh, assets, uh, uh, you know, short term, long term, uh, uh, revenues, profits, and so on and so on. And when, uh, that's the year, the quarter, and so on, when it is. And you see that all of that together give you the coordinate of a specific value, right? So one way to think of it, because as you can imagine, when you have a hypercube, in, in that case, that's already five dimensions that I'm giving you here. I don't think that it's easy for any of us to visualize five dimensions, right? So of course, we cannot do that. But fortunately, there is an easy way, as an alternate way, to, to visualize a cube with so many dimensions. And this is called a fact table. The term fact table is very important. Make sure to remember it. it's a fact table. What is a fact table? It's just a list of the values in all the little cubes right there. But instead of organizing the little cubes in a big cube in that way, instead, we list the little cubes, right? So if you look at this fact table, what is happening is that this is one little cube, this is another 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 little cube, and this is another little cube, right? Okay, so one little cube on every row, and here you have the dimensions. So in that case, there are three dimensions, and in this last column, you have the values. What that means, for example, is that in Germany for the year 2016, Peter sold for uh, $1,000 of products. That's an example. Then you have Germany 2015, Mary, 15,000, Switzerland 2016, Mary, uh, 1,500, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is just an alternate view to this one. This one, you can do it for two or three dimensions, but not more than three. But this is easy to generalize to 10 dimensions. You just have more columns, right? For whom is this intuitive, what a fact table means? Right, okay. So we have the dimensions and we have the, uh, the values on the right. Now, the sort of things you can start considering doing when you have a cube like that is to start aggregating things. For example, you might be interested in what Peter specifically sold and you might be interested in specifically the year 2015, but you don't care about Switzerland and Australia. You don't care about the details uh, about that. Um, so what you want to do is aggregate all of that. So instead of knowing that there's three thousand dollars for Switzerland and six thousand for Australia, you just want to know that it's nine thousand for everything, right? So what you do is that you uh, you can aggregate the things uh, uh, together and produce a new table. Um, but let's start with something even simpler, even simpler: the notion of slicing. So you know that in the relational algebra. You can select, you can project, you can group, you can sort, uh, you can rename, and so on and so on. With cubes, the first thing that you can do is slice. You can slice a cube. What does it mean? It means that you look at the cube. So here it's the actually cubic representation of the cube, and you take a slice of it, just like you would take a slice of a cake, right? This is called slicing. This is a slice of the original cube that I display now as a fact table. So it's the slice with just Switzerland. So we are taking the slice corresponding to Switzerland, meaning it, we keep just these two cubes, these two cells. They are called cells, the little cubes. So we take these two, and we have here a slice of the uh, big cube with just these two little cells, right? With 2016 Mary and 2015 Peter, but just Switzerland. This is called slicing, right? So again, this is slicing viewed on the cubic representation. Uh, and this is slicing on the facts table representation of the BQ. Okay, now let us let me show you the aggregation. So the aggregation means, I don't know if you see what's going on on that picture, but here you have these little cubes and you see you also have one little cube, one little cube, one little cube, right? But aggregation means that we merge like this in that dimension. You see this is all merged now, 
right? So we are 3D here, and now we become 2D, right? Now we only have this dimension and that dimension, but we merged it along the third dimension. So now coming back to what I showed you earlier, we want to merge uh, the countries and only preserve the time, so the year and the, the salesperson, and this is what we get, right? We have one dimension less because we aggregated against all countries, but now we have the sum. And you can see, if you look at it, 3,000 plus 6,000, Peter 2016, it's right there, Peter 2016, 9,000. Now we have Mary 2016, uh, that's 1.5 thousand, Mary 2016, 1.5, Mary 2015, Mary 2015, we have right here and right here, so that's uh, 15 plus one, that's 16,000. And Peter 2016, Peter 2016, that's here. And I think in that case, there's only this, so that's a thousand. Right. Who understands how, by saying that I'm aggregating over the countries, I go from here to here? Who can do it on any other example? Can higher? Yeah, I want to make sure you're following. Okay. So this is called aggregating, right? Okay. You can also view the aggregation with an alternate way of thinking, an alternate mindset. You can view it as a slice, but a slice on what? A slice on the total of the countries. So you could consider that there are all your countries, right? So Germany, Australia, China, India, Switzerland, France, United States, and so on and so on. These are all the possible value, values for the country. But another possible value for the countries is the whole world, right? You could also imagine regions, continents, right? Europe, uh, America, Asia, and so on, Africa. And you could imagine also, um, I don't know, regions and cities and so on. So in fact, now you realize that a dimension like that is actually a hierarchy of values, right? It's not just a flat list, it's a whole hierarchy. And when you have a hierarchy, you have the top level hierarchy, which is worldwide. Right, worldwide. And of course, what is worldwide? It's just the sum of everything, right? Of uh, that, the sum of all countries, for example. So when I'm saying that I look at the aggregation over the whole world, it is the same as saying that I'm taking a slice of my cube on the worldwide value of the country dimension. For whom is that clear? Okay, very good. So now we know how to slice and we know how to aggregate things. There is a buzzword that people use for um, data cubes or data analytics is slice and dice. Whoever heard slice and dice? Nobody heard? Oh, some of you, okay, slice and dice. So I'm going to explain to you what it means to slice and dice data. Slice you already know now. I already told you what a slice is, but I need to explain to you what dicing actually means. You will see it's very, very visual. So why are we slicing and dicing? Well, there is a reason. It's that we are human beings and we are completely incapable of visualizing 10 dimensions. So we need to visualize the data in a way that we understand. Now you could tell me we already know how to do that. This is the fact table. You can just look at the fact table. The problem is that even a fact table is challenging. Even if I give you that with millions of values, what can you do with that, right? Except for scanning for the millions of values. That's still not a view that is user friendly. Let me put it otherwise. If the CFO asks you for the quarterly numbers and you just ship that to them, they will maybe not be very happy, right? So you need fancier ways of doing things. And this is where slicing and dicing is actually coming into play. Um, typically what happens is that you take your dimensions and you, you select some of those dimensions as dicers, typically two dimensions, just because there's two dimensions on a screen or a, on a sheet of paper. So two dicers, two dicing dimensions, and all the rest you put as slicers, right? So you, you classify your dimensions as dicers and slicers. So in my examples, we'll have two dicers one dicer is basically just underusing your screen because one dicer would just mean that you have one dimension, but you can do it if you want, right? Three dicers, the problem is that a, a screen as of today is not three-dimensional. That change in the future, but right now it's, it's, uh, it's uh, two-dimensional. So typically in three dicers, 
um, it forces you to design the user interface probably with tabs or sheets, uh, as you see in spreadsheets. So this is why I'm focusing on two, which is the, the typical use case. Here you go. This is what it means to slice and dice. So the slicing means we select a few dimensions and values. We say, okay, for the product, we only look at the servers. For the countries, we only look at the whole world aggregated. And for the currency, we only look at US dollars. So we are looking only on that portion of the cube that corresponds to these uh, sliced values. So this is the slicers. But what I still have, the dimension that I didn't slice on, there's the time dimension, and then there is the salesperson dimension. These dimensions, I'm going to put on horizontal vertical. I'm going to say my time is a dicer on the columns, and salesperson is a dicer on the rows. What that means is that you're putting the headers here, you're listing the salespersons on the row headers, you're listing the times, maybe I should put it in white, on the columns, 2014, 2015, 2016, and so on. This is what it means to dice, right? You dice like this and like that. So what you get is a two-dimensional table right here with every row being a salesperson, every column being a year, Plus you have your slicers over there that take the subset of the cube that you're looking at, right? And then all the values will appear in your user interface automatically computed and organized in this view. This is called cross tabulation. That's also an important term, right? Cross tabulation. A cross tabulation is typically interactive meaning that you can actually change things. For example, you can click here and change from servers to television, or you can click here and change to Switzerland, or you can click here and change to Swiss francs, or you can drag this all over here and select 2014, and you can drag this all over here and see your products in the columns and so on. In fact, you can do that with many of the spreadsheet software available, like uh, Excel, for example. I don't know, maybe OpenOffice, LibreOffice also offer that. So you can literally, in your spreadsheet software, import something like this as a CSV file, for example, open it in your spreadsheet, then you select it, and you have somewhere in the menu a pivot table mode. That's how they call that, the, the fancy name in spreadsheets for cross tabulation, pivot table. And then it's going to open a new sheet where you can do that, right? And then you have a section where you have your slicers, you have a section for your dicer. So of course, when you open it the first time, it's all empty and just there's placeholders, but then you can drag and drop your dimensions nicely and so on. So one thing that I encourage you to do in order to make sure that you understand what's going on with data cubes is try it. Try with a spreadsheet software to open a file like this, and we will give you samples probably in the exercises and so on, uh, and try to slice and dice the data in this way. Okay, this is what is uh, typically done. Looking at the time, it's almost time for the break. Uh, maybe I can actually stop here uh, for now. Uh, we can take a break, and then at quarter past. Um, Quarter past 11, we'll continue and tell you a bit how we can implement that. Guess what? In SQL. We can actually use SQL query in order to produce the data that you see in a cross-tabulated view. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll see you at quarter past 11. <laughs>